Nathaniel Cook, um, and today we're going to talk about anomaly detection. Um, we'll get into a minute what I mean by that, but a uh, little first background on me. I worked for Qualtrics for about six years. Um, they're here local in, in down in Utah Valley, and I started as a developer for them and then quickly migrated into an operations position, and so I've been doing kind of the dev and the ops together for about six years now. Um, but now I'm back working as a developer again for Influx Data. I've been there for about 10 months, and I build their product called Capacitor. And again, we'll get to that here in a minute, but essentially the entire Influx Data suite is around collecting your metrics, your time series data, and then doing useful things with them, okay? So to get started, let's kind of ask a few questions here. So how many of you guys have a TV monitor somewhere up in your office with a dashboard on it that's got metrics, okay? So we got, that, that was a significant majority there. Okay, great. How many of you have looked up at your dashboard, seen something odd, and then were able to go and address it and resolve an issue pretty quickly? Great. Yeah, so about, about the same. Okay. So then how many of you have had an incident, got it resolved, and then afterwards looked at your dashboard and realized that it was there staring you in the face, but you missed it? Okay. That, that's happened to me plenty. And, it, you know, that happens, right? So today, basically what I'm gonna talk about is how do we automate watching our dashboards, or in other words, anomaly detection, okay? So, in DevOps, we are really good at collecting metrics, right? Um, Julia gave a great talk earlier. It's really easy to collect metrics. Actually, about five years ago, Ian Mal Malpass um, from Etsy wrote a little blog post, and he titled it, Watch, or measure anything, measure everything, which is kind of where I stole my title from. And his, his, his blog post introduced StatsD to the world. So how many of you have heard of or used StatsD? Right, so same people that have dashboards, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a simple utility, and the point of it was it made it really, really easy for you to metric or measure something about your application, whether that's CPU usage to memory usage to requests and page times in your application, right? So really good at doing that because we have tools that make it really easy, and it's, it's kind of part of our culture. We've, we've kind of adopted that measure anything, measure everything. And then we come back and we use that data, okay? And, you know, just to kind of give you a scale, it's really, you know, a small shop could collect millions of unique metrics at tens of terabytes a month. Uh, we typically downsample that data pretty heavily and so we don't have storing it all, but that's the kind of data collection we're talking about just to see how our CPUs are doing. Okay, so the problem, why I'm here today, scalability. While having a dashboard is very important, and I'm not recommending that you tear down your dashboards, they are very important, and they provide visibility into things that you do, they don't scale very well. When you need to see and know about lots of things that are going on, you just can't watch all of your metrics, right? So at, a, at Qualtrics where I worked, I don't remember the top, top of my head, but somewhere around probably close to a million unique metrics, right? We just couldn't watch them all. And we just couldn't see them all. And so the whole dashboard, all the things, yeah, it didn't work out quite well. So, and then the other thing is st static thresholds where you'd want to set an alert saying, hey, the data went too high. Um, those don't scale very well because it ends up requiring a lot of maintenance to tweak those thresholds, right? So if, you've, if you're measuring page times and they're going up and down with the daily cycle, well, maybe you put a lower threshold. But maybe that changes from January to July. And maybe it changes from Monday to Friday. And so you spend a lot of time trying to tweak those static thresholds, and they just don't scale because of the human involvement that needs to be there. And then again, the tooling isn't very easy right now. And, or at least, I'm hoping to change that today with some of our, some of our talk. So in essence, we need to automate watching our dashboards. Really simple. Okay, so what do I mean when I say anomaly detection? So I don't know if you can see this. Well, it kind of comes out. So if you can see this, how many anomalies do you see in that graph? Okay, shout out numbers. Two. two? Okay. Who thinks there's more than two? Okay. Who thinks there's less than two? Okay. So it actually, the answer depends on what you're trying to find, right? It depends on what you define as not normal. An anomaly means something that is not normal. So there's two that were highlighted. Those are probably the two that people saw, right, where one peak is really high and one peak is really low, and both peaks aren't at the regular interval of the other peaks. Right? So we could consider those peaks normal. And then, and then the graph data along the bottom, normal as well. And so finding those is difficult sometimes, right? A static threshold can't find that. 
because it couldn't find the small peak and it can't find the tall peak at the same time. So how do we do that? And today I want to talk about the easy ways of doing that, the, the approachable ways. Because when people start talking about anomaly detection, they start pulling out really heavy statistical models and they start going crazy off the deep end with the math and having a lot of fun, but not really getting anything done. So let's, let's talk about the simple ways of getting this done. Okay, so then to put it in, in context here, I build the product capacitor and I work with Influx Data and we build these other products. And, but the concept is the same. So what I'm talking about today doesn't have to apply directly to capacitor, it applies to any metric anomaly section. Essentially, you collect data, you shove it into a database, and then you pull it back out of the database and you look at it. And you determine whether or not it's anomalous or whether or not it's normal, okay? So in InfluxDB product terms, that would be telegraph to collect your data, InfluxDB to store your data, and then capacitor is the piece that will go and grab your data and look at it and, and do whatever you want with it, okay? So machine, or er, sorry, so ways we can watch our metrics, okay? So we can do it with our eyes, right? We can just look at a dashboard and we can see, oh, there's something weird there, right? Our eyes are actually really good at processing that information. They see a dip, they see a spike, they see even a flat line when it's normally moving up and down and they're like, ah, something's different. So our eyes are really good at that and take some challenges to turn that into um, a mathematical model, but it's possible. We talked about static thresholds. Um, there's also these, this realm of machine learning and statistical models, right? So who here is familiar with machine learning? You've heard of it before and, okay. So who here has attempted to use machine learning in any form, not even anomaly detection for metrics? Okay, so significantly fewer hands. Almost everybody raised their hand on heard of it, okay? So who here has actually taken a class, like from a school or somewhere on machine learning? Okay, so basically the same people that said they tried to use it, okay? So turns out machine learning is this big, huge name, and you can actually do it really simply, okay? So three steps to machine learning. Grab a set of data, and in the context of anomaly detection, we're just looking for things that are abnormal. So we just want a set of normal data. Just give me something that's normal. And then you feed it into a model. For now, that model is a black box. We don't care what it is. We just shove it in. Fed it all of our data. And then when, then that model, that black box, just spits out a few numbers. What those numbers are is they characterize the normal behavior of the data. Now, how it does that, we don't care. Black box, right? And then we can take those same parameters later that the, that the black box spit out, and we can feed it our, new, our data again, not the, not the test training data, but new data. And we can feed it those parameters, and the black box can say, yeah, that data fit those parameters. Or no, it didn't. And so then we get this yes, no answer on whether it's anomalous or not. And technically, you can get like a continuous score, and there's all kinds of techniques and variations on that. But that is essentially machine learning 101. Grab a set of data create a model that characterizes the data and, an, and then feed it new data and ask it if that data fits what it expected to see, okay? So there's lots of different ways to do these models, but let's, let's pick a really simple one, okay? So st statistics, right? When soon as someone starts talking about machine learning, they start talking about statistics. But today we're just gonna talk about, well, that might be a lie, sorry. I may go crazy on the statistics later. But right now, we're just gonna talk about standard deviation and mean. So who here is familiar with how you would compute a standard deviation of mean on a set of data, right? Okay, so pretty much everybody raised their hand. Really simple, the mean is the average of the data. And so if you've got this wave of data like this, you get a nice flat line, and that's your mean. The, the standard deviation is how much your data changes. So if you have a flat line of data, your standard deviation is basically zero, meaning your data doesn't move up and down. If your data moves up and down a lot, then your standard deviation gets bigger. Okay? So the model we're gonna use is we're gonna say our black box is gonna compute the standard deviation and mean of our data. And the parameters that pops out the end are just those two numbers, mean and standard deviation. So then if you take new data and you stick it back in to the black box, you can say, well is my new data within that, is it close to the same mean and does it fall within the same standard deviation? If it does, then yes, it's normal. If it doesn't, then it's anomalous. So that's a very simple, anomaly detector, and it's actually pretty effective de depending on where you use it. Okay, so that's kind of our idea here, and the last step is to compare that data 
against, sometimes you'll use like a threshold, right? So if your standard deviation, so statistics, bell curve is your standard deviation. One standard deviation away from your data means 50% of your data lies in that range. So typically people will choose something like 3, 3 or 3.5, because that means like 99.9% .9 of your data will fall in that range. So if it's outside of that range, you're talking about data that's 0.001% chance of happening. And so anomalous on those ranges, okay? So just said a lot of numbers, just said a lot of things. I'm a very visual learner, so let's look at a graph. Hopefully that's visible in the back. Um, there are three lines on this graph. We care about the green one first, okay? The green one is the one in the middle. What we're looking at is the CPU usage of my laptop last week, okay? And the far, and it's four days. It's Monday, when, or, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And you can now tell what time I get up and go to work in the morning and what time I get back. But there you go, sorry. Hopefully that's not revealing in any kind of way. Um, so the green line, focusing on the green line, you can see that this is the CPU usage, it's idle, C idle CPU, so 100% idle means I'm not doing anything. So when the graph drops, it means my, my, my laptop's getting busy. So the green line comes along, Sunday, didn't go to work, stays pretty normal. Then Monday, you can see that there's a little bit of a dip on the green line. And then Tuesday again and Wednesday again. And so you can see kind of those eight hours or so that my CPU is busy. So then what are these blue and orange lines doing in there, okay? So those are taking the prior day's data, computing the mean and standard deviation, and creating a little range of where we expect data to be. So on Monday, you can see that the green line dips below the orange line because on Monday, the model only understood Sunday and Sunday was flat. So it expected Monday to stay flat. And so that, when it didn't, if you, look, if you look at the blue and orange lines, they're staying relatively flat all the way through Monday. But then on Tuesday, the blue and orange lines say, oh, I learned from Monday what a normal work day is like. And so there's this bigger range of okay values. And you notice that on Tuesday, the green line never leaves the bounds of the other two lines. And same thing on Wednesday. So this wasn't the ideal model because every Monday I'm gonna get an alert that says something's weird, right? So maybe I just changed my model to use last Monday and then on Tuesday I use last Tuesday and really simple, right? But this hopefully illustrates the point, okay? So then I want you to ask yourself a question, which is covered up. So the question is, <laughs> how would you write this in code, right? So, so we, we talked about it, we visualized it, how would you code this? How would you go about actually architecting a system and describing this problem in code? Okay, hopefully you had like a second. At least kind of, I mean not, not, not details, right? But kind of go through that exercise in your mind, okay? Because next slide's gonna be some code. And so, okay, there comes some code. Okay, so, all of that code does everything I just talked about. That's complete code example for capacitor. And it's pretty simple. I mean, you don't know the language yet. You don't know anything about it. And we'll walk through it here in a second. But it's pretty simple. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we're talking about doing some things that are probably outside of a lot of people's comfort zone. I know they were out of mine not too long ago. And by just kind of digging in and poking at things, you can kind of figure it out, okay? So let's kind of, I know, walking through code. Bear with me for just a second. So at the very top, we just have a simple select my data, okay? Select the mean and standard deviation from the data, right? And then notice the offset parameter says go grab yesterday's data by offset the, the time by which you're gonna grab data by one day. And then go do that every five minutes. Okay, so every five minutes, we're gonna go grab yesterday's data. And how much data we're gonna grab? That's defined by the period or the length of data that you wanna grab, which is one hour. So every five minutes, you're now grabbing yesterday's data for an hour at 
you know, so if it's 8 a.m. on Wednesday or 11 whatever on Wednesday, then you're gonna grab Tuesday's 11 whatever hour of data. Okay, and we're just gonna, now we've got that data. Okay, we've got it. And we've got the mean and standard deviation of that data, done. Okay, so then the next thing we're gonna do is gonna grab today's data. So then we select the mean of today's data, and now we've got this one number, today's mean. Okay, and then we did it at the same frequency every five minutes, same period, So this time we didn't give it an offset. We didn't say go grab yesterday's data, we said grab today's data. Then simply, we just take those two data points and we just join them together, and we say, tell me if they're anomalous, which is a simple mathematical expression. If the difference between today's mean and yesterday's mean is greater than 3.5 times the standard deviation of yesterday's data, then anomaly. Something's really weird because the mean of my data today is so far off the mean of my data yesterday. So now you've got a very, very simple anomaly detector. Okay? So questions, pausing for questions at this point. I've, I've covered a lot and a lot of detail and I did it pretty fast. So questions, just check up, follow, clarification. Silence is good, I can handle silence too. Okay, so everybody's just like right with me on the stats here. I'm getting a lot of head shakes, good, I like that. Okay, perfect. So, now we're gonna go on to a different way of doing this, okay? So, I talked about machine learning and there's basically three steps, grab your data, define a model, and then check it again. So, let's play around with different kinds of models. So let's, pay, let's play around with a predictive model. So inside of Capacitor, there is a algorithm already pre-built for you called Holt Winters. Who here has hold, heard of Holt Winters before? Okay, so we've got a few stats guys back there. Holt Winters is an algorithm from the 60s that predicts the future, right? So it's, it's an amazing algorithm. It's been predicting the future since the 60s, just in case you didn't know. And uh, it, it's actually really simple what it does is you just give it some data and it just optimizes and, exp and checks for the growth and will predict the next several data points, right? So in, in our example here, let's say we're giving it the, the request count and we, we take the last 30 days of data and we say predict the next day of data. So you get a whole 30 days of data to learn the patterns in the data and then tell me what the next day is gonna be like. Okay, so that's pretty simple. And that's our black box again. We don't need to know how Holt Winters works. We just know what it does. It just tells us what the next day of data is gonna be. So we take that and we put it into our algorithm again. And we say, go grab the data, predict the next day. And then what we really do is we just say, today's the 15th. So go grab the 30 days from May 14th, May, May 13th to June 14th. Go grab that data and then predict what today should be. And then check, is today very different from what I expected based on my previous trends, right? So this is something very useful for your, your growth, right? You've got a very simple growth. You know that day over day or week over week, your growth, your, your website sees this much more traffic, right? Maybe it's even on an annual scale. I know that I saw that a lot at, at, at Qualtrics where there was very, very clear patterns. Holt Winters can find those patterns easily and can predict your data. So then if it predicts, hey, Tuesday should have a lot of, you know, should have this much many requests and then something goes wrong in your system and pff, no requests or very few, you now have a predictor that can tell you about those things. Okay, so let's, I mean, that's, it's a significantly more complicated um, process model that we just introduced, but let's look at the code again for it. Okay, essentially the same code actually, just instead of calculating the mean and standard deviation, we just send it through the whole winter's algorithm. So we grab our training data, then we send it through the whole winter's algorithm, we get that data point, we get today's data, and we compare it. Is the difference between the predicted value and my value divided by my predicted value, that's an, like an error percentage, is that value significantly off, right? Greater than 20%, or in this case. And, and so notice that static thresholds actually come back a lot, right? So in the previous example, we had a static threshold of 3.5 standard deviations. In this example, we have a 
a static threshold of 20% change. But what we've done is we've transformed the data into a new system where the, the, the change is now very obvious that it was a change, right? It wasn't just mixed in there with, with all the other data where you couldn't find it, like the initial graph where those two spikes may have been hard to spot initially. Um, you've now transformed your data into a space where if, it, if there's a spike, that means an anomaly. Okay? So, let's check another model out. So this is another project that I've been working on. Um, this is, so Capacitor is completely open source, and this other project that I've written is called Morgoth. If you want to know why I named it that, you can come talk to me later. It's a really funny story. Um, but we, but it's an, a, it's an algorithm that I've been working on that, that plugs into Capacitor as long as other things. And then you, sorry. And, and the cool thing about this one is it's a little bit different than the other algorithms where you had to feed it normal data. This algorithm will learn your normal data for you. And this is, in the sense, a much more true and true machine learning algorithm where it's unsupervised in the, in the linguistics of machine learning, meaning that you don't have to sit there and tell it what's good and what's bad. You simply give it the data and it figures it out. This one actually does a really simple um, approach. It uses something called the lossy counting algorithm. Um, basically, it just counts your data and it counts the unique patterns that it sees in your data. And anything that shows up that isn't common in your data is an anomaly. And you just set a, you set a percentage. You say, if something shows up less than 1% of the time, that's an anomaly. And it just keeps track of all of the common patterns. So you may have four or five common patterns in your data and it just keeps track of them all and counts each instance that it sees of those. And then if it sees something new, it's like, ah, that's something new, that's an anomaly. So pretty straightforward. So how would you do something, how would you do something like that in, in Capacitor? Okay, so again, even simpler. Since we didn't have to go select our training data or anything, since this thing is unsupervised, it just accepts a stream of data. We just go grab our stream of data, say from our request count, and we window up our data into five minute buckets, and we just feed it into the algorithm called Morgoth. And we say, go do your thing. And it can do lots of different things. We won't cover all the details today. Um, if you want to talk to me, I'd love to, to chat afterwards. Um, but it gets, you know, for example, here we're just telling it to use a very similar approach before we take the mean and standard deviation and use those to, to count your, your standard data. Okay? And then finally, go and trigger an alert. And, and the way this one works is the Morgoth algorithm just spits out a score at the end of the day. You give it five minutes of data, it says, ah, that is a score of nine or, or 0.9, and that, or that's a score of 0.1, and it's a zero value between zero and one, and if you get a value closer to one, it means this is much more likely to be anomalous. And so then you can put, yet again, a static threshold on that anomaly score, okay? And then a quick, quick note, shout out to some of our, our vendors here. Uh, Capacitor will integrate, as far as alerting goes, with pretty much any alerting tool you've ever heard of, including VicDrops, the guys downstairs, as well as PagerDuty, Alerta, Opsgenie, et cetera, the list goes on. So um, Capacitor, being open source, tries to integrate with all the other friendly, friendly tools out there. Okay. Okay, so after all that, so I've shown you three models. I've shown you how you can use those models to find anomalies. And so the biggest question is, how do you pick a model, right? And this is the hard part. This is, this is truly the hardest part about all of this, right? Getting your data, easy, right? We've been doing that for years. Even writing scripts to consume your data, easy. We've been doing that for a while as well. But how do you pick a model that, this, how do you pick this black box that actually works, right? So, so what are some things that you would want out of a black box in your model? What are some good things about an anomaly detector? Here's something. Okay, what would you not want your anomaly detector to do? Okay, you don't want it to be noisy, right? Okay, so you don't want it to sit there and yell at you all the time that something's wrong when there's nothing really wrong, right? So, properties of an anomaly detector, very simple. Technical terms, false positive rate, false negative rate, 
detection delay. But essentially, you want it to find anomalies, you don't want it to tell you about things that aren't really anomalous, and you want it needs to be relatively quick about it, right? So some of the examples I've been giving have been like day-long periods, right? And some of you are probably asking, request count drops, I predicted it for the day, I'm gonna have to wait a day to get the answer, I can just see the graph within a day, right? So you can, you can re reduce the time scale as needed and predict as fast as you like, and, but within, within reason, everything's gonna take a little bit of time to compute, and, and so, you, you know, you wanna measure your detection delay. So it's really important is that you know the cost of these properties of your anomaly detector, okay? I wanna stress this a lot, okay? So, how many, how many alerts do you think an ops developer can tolerate in a day? That like one's actually go do something about, right? Yeah, I was on call for years. In fact, I was like the only DevOps guy at Qualtrics for a really long time. And so I was like, it. And it was, yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> so my experience says if, a, if an individual engineer is getting more than 10 alerts a day that are actually actionable, you have to go do something about, big problems, right? Like that engineer's time is 100% to just putting out fires. Bad, right? So, so if your false positive rate is such that you're creating more than 10 alerts a day or something like this, you know, you've got serious problems. Either everything's breaking and you need to go fix it, or you're being way too sensitive about what's going on and you need to back off, right? So it's kind of some ballpark stuff, okay? So what's the cost of missing an alert? Of thinking something's not anomalous when it really was? Right? That's gonna depend a lot on what you're metricing. And so if you're metricing, if you've got, you know, a site where you actually sell something and you're metricing revenue, and your revenue drops and your system somehow thought it was normal because of doing that occasionally and it's like, ah, oh, it's normal. Big problem, right? The cost of that is really high. So it's this balancing game between your false positive rate and your false negative rate. And then there's also a cost for how long it takes you to realize that something's down. Because if, for example, your revenue just tanked and it takes you 10 minutes to realize that because your loading system is sitting there crunching away and being all smart but not telling you anything useful, then problems, right? So you kind of, those are the three aspects of your black box model and you need to know what they are. So it's pretty straightforward. Measure them, right? We can use data to know what our false positive rate is or our false negative rate or our detection delay, okay? So capacitor makes that really easy and my takeaway today is for you to just try it out, okay? So I'll show you an example in a second of how capacitor here, actually I'm gonna skip to that. Okay, so capacitor makes it really easy. Um, here's a command, capacitor currently has no front-facing UI, it's all CLI via an HTTP API, and you know, UI is coming, but right now you've got the, a very nice CLI. Single command, capacitor, replay, live my data from the request count alert task that we just saw the code for, for the past 180 days, okay? So let's say you chose standard deviation and mean as your model to find anomalies, and you've been collecting your data in InfluxDB or some other database. You can just say, go run my algorithm for the past 180 days. Tell me every time you got an anomaly, and then you can go look at those anomalies and say, yeah, that was true, or that was not, that was a false positive, or that was a false negative. And you can then score your anomaly detection algorithm and say, yes, this, this meets our criteria. This is okay, we can put this out there. Or you can, you know, the next step is, well, maybe it missed an anomaly. So then you go tweak it. You've got all your historical data, you go tweak your algorithm, and you, you manage to make it to, ah, okay, now we catch our anomaly. So you had an outage yesterday, the smoke's blown over, and you, you're back at the RCA phase, and you're like, okay, so what's going on? How do I fix it? And so, hey, well, first off is we didn't know what happened. Why didn't we know what happened? It was this really weird combination of things. So you go, you iterate on your model, you fix it, great. Now, your anomaly detection would have flagged you, and you can empirically say in your postmortem that our anomaly detection code will now catch this type of an outage, which is really powerful. 
And you can also say that it also won't increase our false positive rate beyond this because we reran it on all of our historical data with one command and we saw that if all, that our change was able to catch the new anomaly and leave everything else alone, right? So that's, that's really powerful because, like I said, anomaly detection can become very hard if you're trying to find difficult anomalies. So Capacitor tries to make the workflow around doing that simple so that you don't have to waste your time digging through data, but rather running tools, looking at results, and thinking about your data, okay? So another example is you can also record not just the live stream of data, but you can also create like test fixture data. You can record a snapshot of data and that will just stay there permanently until you delete it and you can use those as like almost unit tests for your anomaly detection framework, which is, which is a powerful concept. Okay. So, and then, and then you can use, and capacitor integrates with InfluxDB obviously, so you can store that data back in there and actually record over time what your false positive and false negative rates are. Okay, so coming back here to my slide. So this is kind of the takeaway, is, is try it out. Pick a metric, pick a model, stick it in, evaluate your model, and get a result. Then go look at your false positive rate, your false negative rate, and see if it's useful, okay? But I have a word of caution to tell you here. Do not pick a metric that is currently on your dashboard. Why am I telling you that? Anomaly detection is much like continuous integration or continuous deployment. You need to get buy-in and you need to have confidence in it. So you need to pick a metric that's actually easy to detect anomalies in and that actually isn't all that important right now. Because the worst thing you want to happen is you go, you play around with this cool new tool and you're like, oh, I'm gonna detect anomalies. And then you, you set it up and it looks good, relatively. You try it out. Three weeks later, you're really comfortable with this tool. You like it, misses an anomaly, everything goes down and everybody's yelling at you like, hey, your cool tool totally messed up. What's your problem? We can't use that tool anymore. That's not the momentum you wanna create. You wanna create the momentum where you're reducing work and making people's life easier, but slowly and incrementally until you're ready to take the plunge, per se, right? And so, what metric should you pick? So, me and ops, I have a, I know which one I would pick first. I would pick disk utilization, or how much usage you're using on your disk. Why? Well, worst case scenario, you leave your existing alerting in and it alerts you that your disk went bad and that it filled up and that you need to go do something or it's about to fill up and you need to go do something, right? But how many of you, because I mean, we used a Nagios-like alerting system in the past, I did, and disk utilization was a simple static threshold. You cross 70% utilization, you get an alert, you need to go figure out why that server is, is filling up so that you have time before it goes back, okay? 70% threshold's good, but what if for the past three months it's been at 69%, today it crossed 70%. Do you need to do anything? No, right, so that's not actionable. And that's noise in your, in your alerts, okay? Because for the next three months it's probably just gonna go up to 71%. So we take that simple Holt Winters algorithm we were just looking at and we predict it into the future. So we take the last 30 to 60 days of disk usage data, maximum per day, and then you say, because you know, disk usage is kind of like a sawtooth as things get cleared out. So you grab your max, predicts a simple growth on your disk usage. Today it crossed 70%, but it predicts for the next week it's only gonna get to 70.5%, and you don't care. So you're, don't, you're not getting an alert for your disk usage. Then you have a server in the last week that's just been log spamming, and it's grown really fast, and you can predict the future, right? So it's gonna tell you in three days, this server is gonna fill up its disk. You just got three days head time to fix the problem, get ahead of it, and you can leave your existing alerting in place so that just in case this isn't working quite right, you messed up some little aspect of the problem, you still get an alert later, and when you're confident, you can, re you can then reduce your alert noise by relying on predictability of your data. So, pick a metric, pick a simple one. Pick one that you think you understand really well. Pick one that's not your key metric for your first time so that you get your feet wet and you understand it and you try it out and then you learn the, re the benefits and you move forward from there, okay? So, so that's it. 
Automate watching your metrics. Find something simple, try it out, ask your neighbor, and, and learn. That, that's how I got here. I am not a data scientist. I have taken statistics classes and et cetera, but this is, this is me trying, learning, figuring it out. It's something anybody can do. So here's some more resources, and we'll open up to questions. Um, if you haven't seen the talk from November's DevOps Days in San Jose by Betsy Nichols, you need to see it. It's great. Today I didn't focus a lot on the different kinds of anomalies there are, because there's lots of different kinds, and focusing more on, on the how. But her talk goes into great detail on how to, what kinds of anomalies there are, how to find them, how to, like how to pick models and these kinds of things. So, and then capacitors, open source, go find it on GitHub, um, send me a PR, I'd love it. Um, come talk to me, um, et cetera. And then Wikipedia is your friend. I've taught myself most of the math from Wikipedia for these algorithms, it's wonderful. You, you can get lost in there, right? You can get lost on lots of things in Wikipedia, but there's all kinds of good things in there about, hey, go try out this new algorithm or this one, and simplify them, keep them simple, and you find that either most of the, the algorithms are either already implemented for you in a language like Python, which you can call out to from Capacitor, or they have an implementation in a similar language where you could port them, or their implementation is so trivial because it's just a for loop that you just do it yourself. And you, you'll find that your, that your mileage can get quite far. So there you go. That's my talk for today. So the question is, how do you tr make sure that the anomaly you just detected doesn't trigger a false alert the next week? So what he's referring to is today, let's say on Monday, my, I didn't go to work. It was Memorial Day. And so that was an anomaly, and I got an alert. So then next Monday, I also don't go to work. So then it thinks that's normal, right? And so then I can just start skipping all my Mondays because I got a holiday on Monday, and now I've beaten the anomaly detection system. So how do you, how do you take care of that? One is you can use multiple time ranges, right? So you can use this Monday, yesterday, and two weeks ago Monday. Or you can flag the data as anomalous and then tell your, your, your code here to just skip anomalous data and just be like, ah, uh, ignore that data. It was actually bad data. Don't consider that normal data in your training set. Thank you. Give him a hand.